So throughout the year, we learned gradual western expansion, starting on the east coast with early colonization, and then spreading gradually west to the Mississippi River after the Revolution, to the Rocky Mountains after the Louisiana Purchase, and eventually to the Pacific Ocean after the Mexican War. All of the settling of that territory gets put on hold, however, because of the Civil War and Reconstruction period. And finally, during the Industrial period, the West simultaneously gets gradually more settled for ranching and farming, while the East becomes more and more industrial. So we're going to talk about the settling of the Western frontier after the Civil War. So like I said before, the frontier is a word that is defined differently throughout U.S. history. First, during the colonial times, upstate New York, where we live, would have been considered the frontier. Very off the beaten path, only occasional fur traders would be living in these areas. During the revolutionary period, upstate New York is a tiny bit more settled, but could still be considered frontier. A lot of the country is considered frontier, especially if it's beyond the Appalachian Mountains, which the British Proclamation of 1763, if you remember, stopped settlement at the Appalachian Mountains. After the fighting of the Revolution, U.S. land holdings go all the way to the Mississippi River. So areas of the Ohio and Tennessee River Valleys might be considered the frontier, but settlement is definitely moving beyond the Appalachian Mountains at this point. Eventually, you have expansion all the way to the Pacific Ocean, mainly during the presidency of James K. Polk, if you remember. He threatens Britain over the Oregon Territory and gains that. He then fights the Mexican War in order to gain the Mexican Cession. So, what is today the continental United States was more or less complete in 1848 at the tail end of James K. Polk's presidency. What we need to talk about in this lesson is how did all of these territories become more and more settled after the Civil War? If you look at this map and you consider the fact that the original 13 colonies really had a western boundary of the Appalachian Mountains. After the fighting of the Revolution, the Mississippi River becomes much more of the western border. Then, in 1803, the Louisiana Purchase makes the U.S. western border the Rocky Mountain Range. Then, during the presidency of James K. Polk, threatens to fight Britain over the Oregon Territory and does fight Mexico for the Mexican Cession. So that is how we expand all of this territory, but what is it that actually settles these areas? The people most directly affected by Western settlement after the Civil War would be Great Plains Indian tribes, such as the Blackfoot, Cheyenne, Comanche, and Sioux. They feel the increased encroachment of white settlers throughout the late 1800s. More and more tribes are losing land, and they do so in three main stages. First, mining. In 1849, the gold rush sees people rushing all the way to the west to settle Oregon and California. I'll skip back to the map for a moment. You'll notice that the map is colored pink in Oregon and California. They became states sooner than all of the territories in between because of the fact that people skipped over those territories to go try to strike it rich in the gold rush. The second stage is ranching. From about 1850 until after the Civil War, the most profitable way to make money in the West was to be a cattle rancher. So a lot of those areas in between that are unsettled territories, they haven't become states yet, anybody there who's a white settler is probably a rancher. And then eventually, especially after the conclusion of the Civil War, farming becomes much more common in the West. The Homestead Act in 1862 means that more people are going to want to try to make a go of it in farming and be independent farmers. The movie Dances with Wolves, depicted here on the left, is an excellent view of the impact that the killing of the buffalo, mass killing of the buffalo, had on the Plains Indian tribes. There's a scene where they come upon hundreds of buffalo that had been killed only for their pelts and their tongues. Meanwhile, the Plains Indian tribes were dependent almost entirely on the migration of these mass buffalo herds for their survival. So majorly, majorly impacts the Plains Indians. And then this picture on the right, you can see just the scale by which white settlers killed buffalo. This is a man. This is a man. This 
is a pile of buffalo skulls. So you can imagine just how many buffalo would have to be killed in order for this picture to have been taken. As white settlers push west, as the impact on the Plains Indians becomes worse, the native tribes push back. Who wouldn't? The most famous examples of violent conflict are the Battle of Little Bighorn in 1876. General George Armstrong Custer leads his 7th Cavalry into the Little Bighorn Valley to attack a Native American village. He and all of his men are surrounded and killed in this attack. In 1877, after a long pursuit by the U.S. Cavalry, Chief Joseph and the Nez Perce tribe surrender and are put on a reservation. And in 1890, the Wounded Knee Creek Massacre. The U.S. Army massacres over 300 men, women, and children, even those trying to flee the attack. So there are a lot of conflicts and in some cases downright massacres going on between the U.S. government or white settlers and the Plains Indians that are so negatively affected by Western settlement. This quote from Chief Joseph, For a short time we lived quietly, but this would not last. White men had found gold in the mountains around the land of winding water. So Chief Joseph is bemoaning the fact that all of the land his tribe was once dependent on is being taken away gradually by whites. The tragic thing for Native Americans, and you could refer back to that Chief Joseph quote, is that there's always a new reason to displace the indigenous population. And every time they receive reassurances that they can live a better life further west. We know, obviously, that that was not true, and that it was not a thoughtful and meaningful offer. Probably one of the most tragic periods in all of history is when the United States and Canadian governments begin operating residential schools. And there is a quote from the period in which one of the people in charge of these programs was quoted as having said, Kill the Indian, save the man. And residential schools' stated goal was to forcibly assimilate Native Americans into white society. We now know that many residential schools across Canada and the United States, in fact, have mass graves on their grounds. So when people resisted, when they tried to escape, when they fought back, they were abused and even killed. And as I said before, that's something that will go down in history as one of the most tragic things ever done from one person to another. Ranchers versus farmers and how they differently see using the land. Ranchers depended on the open range to move cattle that they had bought in Texas to railroad lines in Kansas. And then those railroad cars from Kansas would take the cattle to Chicago slaughterhouses. However, farmers are growing more and more angry with ranchers because the herds of cattle are trampling their crops. A major change out west was in 1874 after Joseph Glidden invents barbed wire, and this allows farmers to fence in their land. In time, this ends the open range concept, and cattle ranching becomes very difficult because farmers have closed off their farms using barbed wire. This is an artistic depiction of Joseph Glidden and also a drawing of how barbed wire is made. You have two strands of straight wire that every certain number of inches a twist of wire is put in it to make a sharp edge. This is first used by uh, farmers to keep ranchers off their land. You see it mostly today in uh, prisons and in areas that need to be major league secure. Airports is another good example. The top of airport fencing is usually uh, barbed wired. This is the conclusion of the presentation. Please make sure that you take the online quiz Please use your notes. If you took good notes and you use them, there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't get a perfect score. Thank you. See you in class.